Thank you for downloading episode 23 of the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. If you enjoy Murder Mile, you'll be delighted to hear that I've set up a secret hidey hole where I shall stash some truly fantastic treats relating to the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast, including behind the scenes videos, crime scene photos, biographies, case notes, transcripts, and exclusive monthly episodes which delve deep into the lives of Soho's most colourful criminal characters, as featured in the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast. And with a tiny donation of just $3 a month, or £2 in real money, you will ensure the future of Murder Mile for years to come. To check out our Patreon page, please go to patreon.com forward slash murder mile, or click on the link in the show notes. Don't forget to stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear more about Murder Mile's recommended podcast of the week. This time, it's the fabulous Based on a True Crime. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the episode. Welcome to Murder Mile. A true crime podcast and audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved and long forgotten murders. All set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is about John Sweeney. A deeply deluded, dangerous and violent alcoholic whose jealousy, rage and hatred of women left a bloody trail of body parts across Europe. Murder Mile contains graphic descriptions of death, which may offend, as well as realistic sounds, so that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, this is Murder Mile. Episode 23, Canal Killers. John Sweeney, Part 1 Today, I'm chugging along the Regent's Canal, passing a recently renovated part of King's Cross called Battle Bridge Basin, a form of Victorian wharf in which vast blocks of Arctic ice were once stored in stone cellars, providing the city with a steady supply of cold drinks, fresh fruit and ice cream, back in the days before fridges. Ooh, a historical tidbit. How fascinating. Now, Battlebridge is perched in the typical kind of former crack hovel and whorehaven, which property developers cram full of empty art galleries, wanky wine bars, offices for arseholes and hardly used shag pads. Having conned a couple of hipster halfwits to stump up a big watch of cash for a drafty shithole in an up-and-coming area which we all know is code for rough as fuck. And perched opposite that is an uneven stony towpath lined with a cavalcade of canal boaters all batting away an endless barrage of baffling questions from nosy nincompoops. Such as... Do you own a boat? Yes, I live on a boat. Oh, well where do you sleep? I sleep in my bed. Oh, and how do you wash? In my shower. And how do you cook? In my kitchen. Drink? From a glass. Stay warm? By the fire. All of which is topped off by a bonkers pile of dribbly mouth plop, such as... So, what do you eat? Only for the frustrated boater to want to reply... Food! I eat food! Only to realise that dipshit muck thick twit won't piddle off until he's received the answer he'd hope that you'd say. Such as... I catch fish with my teeth... I forage in bins, I blow otters for tobacco cash, and I grow my own mung beans using an old mix of earwax, toe chud, and belly button fluff. Sadly, this is very true. And if this area sounds familiar to you, that's because it's just 
100 meters from the flat of drug dealer Michael Walsh, 300 meters from Caledonian Road, and 600 meters from the West End portal of the Islington Tunnel, where devoted father, Italian tour guide, and heroin addict Sebastiano Magnanini was found hogtied to a shopping trolley and dumped in the region's canal. And it was here, at Battlebridge Basin, on the 19th of February 2001, that in six separate bags, weighed down with house bricks, the ten dismembered body parts of a woman were fished out of the canal. These hastily hacked up remains, having belonged to the ex-girlfriend of a jealous, drunk and vengeful sadist, whose name was John Sweeney. Born John Patrick Sweeney on Saturday the 13th of October 1956, Sweeney was raised in Kirkdale, a working-class district of Liverpool that borders the towns of Bootle, Walton and Everton. In an area when this prosperous city had shifted from being one of the busiest shipping ports, only to slide into economic decline and endemic poverty, and to end up full of crumbling Victorian terraces, pockmarked with the bomb craters of the World War II Blitz. Sweeney's upbringing was unremarkable and uneventful. And although the family was poor, Jack and Catherine, his parents, instilled into their son an Irish Catholic sense of morality, pride, hard work and family values. And although life was tough, money was tight, and the future looked bleak. In 1950s Liverpool, a city packed full of working-class Irish families, Sweeney's childhood was normal. And as a bright boy from a good family with no qualifications, although he spoke with a stutter for which the young boy was mercilessly bullied, Sweeney set about learning a trade, earning a wage, and seeing the world as a jobbing carpenter. For five years, Sweeney crossed the continent, working on various construction sites in France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, and Holland, with a kit bag full of tools, a wallet full of cash, and an eye for the ladies. But it was here during this blank spot in his history, that Sweeney's personality changed forever. Something had shifted, something had snapped, and something had broken. And what returned to England a few years later was a bitter, angry and jealous man whose life was consumed by a passion for drink, a hunger for drugs and a thirst for extreme violence. Age 20, having returned to Liverpool, John Sweeney still looked like the boy who had left a few years earlier. With his curly red hair, dark blue eyes, a cheeky grin, and arched clown-like eyebrows. But now his hair was thinning, his eyes were bloodshot, his nose was bulbous, his cheeks were rosy, like those of a rampant alcoholic, and his almost angelic face which always seemed to be smiling, cheery and kind, belied a vicious temper and a sadistic rage, which bubbled beneath. Sweeney had come home, to see his family, to settle down, and to find himself a wife. But this road to love would ultimately lead Sweeney down the path to violence, torture, dismemberment and death. Having found himself a good woman with a warm heart, a kind smile and strong family values, in 1976 John Patrick Sweeney married Anne Bramley and moved into their matrimonial home in Skelmersdale in Lancashire 
14 miles from his hometown of Kirkdale, which was quickly followed by the births of their two children, Michael and Tracy. But this was not the home of a happy family. With Sweeney's binge drinking and excessive use of cannabis, two very different drugs known to cause and also exacerbate a user's sense of aggression, hostility, depression, anxiety, and paranoia. Not only had Sweeney started using aliases, like Joe Johnson, Joe Carroll, and often being referred to as Scouse Joe, to cover his ever-increasing criminal convictions for drunkenness, drug possession, theft and assault. But as a father and a husband, he was often absent, distant and violent. In 1979, three years into their turbulent marriage, with the safety of her two toddlers to consider, as well as her own life, and having reported Sweeney to the police on numerous occasions for assault and battery, Anne made the brave decision and divorced her violent and abusive husband. But just two years later, having apologised and promised Anne that he was a changed man, with the drink and drugs behind him and a bright future ahead, Anne gave Sweeney one last chance. And in 1981, they remarried. But Sweeney hadn't changed. He was still drunk, drugged and dangerous. And with Anne having left him once before, her rejection had lit a fire in Sweeney's belly. And there was no way that she was ever going to leave him again. Their second marriage would last barely a year. Becoming more paranoid, hostile and violent. Having thrown bricks at her window, bashed in her family turtles and repeatedly threatened Anne's life, verbally, physically and even artistically. With Sweeney having handed his young son a gruesome pencil sketch depicting his mother, dead and lying in a coffin, scrawled on the gravestone the words, Rest in peace, Anne. Once again, fearing for her family's life, Anne made a midnight run to the safety of her family home in Northampton. But no matter how far she ran, or how well she hid, Sweeney would always find her. In November 1982, having moved herself and her young children into a small cottage in Ormskirk, a small market town in West Lancashire, just 14 miles north of Liverpool, Anne thought she had found sanctuary. But her peace was shattered, as she had been followed here by Sweeney. That evening, as a cold wintry wind whipped over the hills, the moon shadowed by thick clouds, and a cold sharp frost crunching underfoot, Sweeney crept towards the family home. Through a crack in the curtains, he spied a single light on inside. But hearing no voices, no sounds and no movement, he broke the lock on the back door, knowing no one was home. Inside lay the detritus of a family life he felt that he was denied by Anne. With food in the cupboards, toys on the floor and photos on the mantelpiece, Sweeney slunk into the darkness of Anne's bedroom, opened the wardrobe, crept inside and hid. And as he stood there, Surrounded by the familiar sight of her clothes and the scent of her perfume. All of which reminded him of how she had rejected him. Sweeney lay in wait for his wife to return. A pickaxe in one hand, a claw hammer in the other.
but he didn't have to wait long. As just a few minutes later, from inside his wife's bedroom, Sweeney heard the jangle of her house keys, her front door unlock, and her house lights slowly illuminate each room as footsteps calmly walked into the bedroom. With his knuckles white with anticipation as he tightly gripped the pickaxe and claw hammer in both fists, having readied himself for a vicious and frenzied attack on his soon-to-be ex-wife, Sweeney burst out of the wardrobe to see... Ah! Two policemen, both big, ready, and packing handcuffs. As Sweeney dropped his weapons, his stutter went into overdrive as he unleashed a volley of excuses about who he was, why he was there, and what on earth he was doing in the wardrobe with a pickaxe and a claw hammer. Thankfully, Anne and the kids, having spent a pleasant evening at their neighbour's house, and heard the sounds of an intruder breaking in, assumed it was a burglar, called the police, and John Sweeney was arrested. But he wasn't charged with attempted murder, or even attempted manslaughter. As with no assault committed, malicious intent being hard to prove, and the incident having occurred in what was technically his house, so the law was at a loss with what to do with him. But owing to his long history of threats and violence against Anne, John Sweeney was bound over to keep the peace by Ormskirk Magistrates Court, meaning that, as a condition of his bail, he had to stay away from Anne. That same year, Sweeney started afresh and moved to London, where he remained for decades, only returning to Liverpool to see his mum. And although he and Anne often crossed paths, for the sake of the kids, they remained on civil terms, until her death in 2001, when she lost a long battle with cancer. The same year, the ten dismembered body parts consisting of two arms, two legs and a woman's torso, wrapped in six separate bags and weighed down with house bricks, were submerged in Battlebridge Basin in the Regent's Canal. But the body in the canal was not Anne. Sweeney never made an attempt on Anne's life again. Maybe he never had the chance. Maybe he still loved her. Or maybe he knew it was wrong to deprive the kids of a loving mother. But with so much jealousy in his eyes, so much hatred in his heart, and so much anger in his bones, Sweeney, once again, went looking for love. And her name was Melissa Halstead. Born in Oakwood, Ohio, the middle child to Margaret and Jack Halstead, a middle-class couple with a dentist surgery in Dayton, Melissa Halstead was bright, bubbly and bold, whose free-spirited nature was matched only by her kindness, warmth and compassion. And being a beautiful woman with sparkling eyes, elegant pose and a stunning bone structure, Melissa was quickly scooped up by New York's famous Ford Modeling Agency, where her career as a fashion model began, touring across America, Europe and Asia. Described by her brother, Jack Jr., as egocentric and magnanimous, Melissa always saw the best in people, never the worst, and although she was slow to trust a stranger, once you were her friend, you were her friend for life. By 1986, having retrained as a fashion photographer and makeup artist, Melissa had settled down in London, and a new chapter in her life was about to begin. 
and end. Melissa told her family very little about her new boyfriend, who was known as Scouse Joe. And quite what she saw in this ruddy-cheeked, red-headed, moody, drunken, twice-divorced handyman, with a lengthy criminal past and a long history of violence, was anybody's guess. But whatever it was, it wasn't worth it. Described by Sweeney as a love-hate relationship, with Melissa being hopelessly besotted by her drunken abusive beau, and him being a short-fused and quick-fisted alcoholic, often he'd explode into a jealous rage. As he pummeled and scarred her strikingly beautiful face with a never-ending series of black eyes, bloody lips and swollen cheeks. The warning signs were there. And on three separate occasions, having tried to leave him, Sweeney was arrested and charged with actual bodily harm for having violently assaulted Melissa during their brief and tempestuous liaison. In September 1987, he smashed her in the face with a stool. In December 1987, he beat her so badly as she lay cowering on the floor that he fractured her legs. On one occasion he was heard to scream, Who do you think you are? I'm the one who says what you can and can't do. And yet, for both offences, he served no prison time and was fined just five pounds. And in April 1988, having threatened Melissa with a knife, scaring her so badly that, in a haunting premonition of her grisly death, she remarked to her sister that, if ever I go missing, it's John Sweeney who would have killed me. This time, Sweeney was bound over by the courts, as had happened previously with his ex-wife Anne the condition being that he had to stay away from Melissa forever. In October 1988, in a mixed blessing by the British government, with Melissa having worked using an expired permit, she was deported from the United Kingdom and restarted her life again in Austria, France, Germany, Belgium and Holland, hundreds of miles away from Sweeney. But no matter how far she travelled, how well she hid, and how carefully she covered her tracks, each time she moved, Sweeney would find her. His anger fueled by drink, his paranoia stoked by spliffs, his jealousy fired up by her rejection, and the court's bail conditions invalid outside of the UK. Having stalked his supposedly deceitful girlfriend across six different European countries, on Tuesday the 1st of November 1988, Sweeney tracked Melissa to her new flat in the Austrian city of Vienna. Being drunk, drugged and deluded, having found it impossible to believe that the relationship's failure was his fault, and obsessed with the idea that Melissa had cheated on him, Sweeney broke in via the back door, bound and gagged her friend, and ransacked the flat as he trashed every cupboard, drawer and box file for evidence of her infidelity. Experience of his violent jealous rages had taught Melissa well. She knew not to rile him, confront him or even answer back. Instead sensing that he needed time to cool off, she purchased him a ticket to Amsterdam, where he could smoke weed, drink beer and chill. Whether this was a kind gesture to quell his agitated mental state, a cunning ploy to distract this dangerous man long enough to escape, 
or an honest promise to rekindle their relationship in the next city on her itinerary is unknown. Regardless, the ruse worked, Sweeney took the ticket and left. But a few days of getting boozed up and stoned out had done very little to quell the fiery scouse's temper, and sensing that this ticket was simply a scam to either pacify him, bribe him, or shrug him off, just as every bloody woman had done in his shitty little life, having rejected his love, his kindness, and his loyalty, oh yes, those lying, cheating bitches had conspired against him, and he would make them pay! Melissa was to blame. She had rejected him, just like Anne. She had abandoned him, just like Anne. And she had destroyed him, just like Anne. Sweeney's anger had come full circle. And now it was time to complete what he had begun. And to get his revenge. On Friday the 4th of November 1988, just four days later, almost exactly six years after his failed attack on Anne from inside her bedroom wardrobe, Sweeney approached Melissa's flat. Unlike that night at Anne's cottage, Melissa was home. Unlike that night, he didn't break in, he knocked. Unlike that night, as Melissa saw her stalker return, a heated argument ensued. But just like that night, six years earlier at Anne's cottage, Sweeney was ready. As grasped in his right hand, his knuckles white with anticipation, he clutched a claw hammer. As Melissa led Sweeney up the stairs to her first floor flat, facing forward with her back turned, she felt a heavy thud, heard a dull crack, and her vision went black. As straddling her, his teeth gritted, his eyes wild, his arm swung high. Sweeney struck the soft skull of a petite woman who was half his weight. His foot-long hammer, raining blows, down upon her with over half a kilo of steel. Somehow, Melissa survived. From her hospital bed, having escaped with her life, and suffered nothing more than severe bruising and a fractured skull, Melissa later stated, I only ever wanted to help him. But now I know he must have really hated me. Later that day, John Sweeney was arrested. For the unprovoked attack on Melissa Halstead, which left the ex-model traumatised, in pain and disfigured. After four months in custody, having claimed that it wasn't a premeditated attack, but an emotional act between two lovers in the heat of passionate debate, Austrian authorities were unable to charge Sweeney with the attempted murder or even attempted manslaughter of Melissa. And once again, Sweeney was found guilty of the lesser charge of aggravated assault. He was sentenced to a 10-year deportation order and just 12 months in prison. His short sentence and early release, having been assured, after an impassioned plea to the judge by the one person that he had almost killed, Melissa. Incredulous at her sister's forgiveness, from her hospital bed, of the man who had attempted to murder her, Chance O'Hara asked her sister if she had lost her frigging mind. But being a kind, warm and caring soul, who only saw the good in people, even those who were bad through and through. Melissa had believed Sweeney's cries, tears, begging, and his promise to leave her alone if she would get him out of prison. 
In March 1989, having accepted his apology and his promise that he was a changed man, with the drink and drugs behind him and a bright future ahead, and just like Anne, Melissa gave Sweeney one last chance. And having served just six months in prison, they rekindled their relationship. Barely a few months later, the footless, handless and headless corpse of 23-year-old Melissa Halstead would be found. Hidden in a duffel bag, floating in a canal, having died at the hands of her evil, sadistic and jealous boyfriend. But Melissa was not the body which had been found at Battlebridge Basin in the Regent's Canal. That woman was still alive and well, as she was yet to become the future ex-girlfriend of John Sweeney. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. And don't forget, if you are the victim of domestic violence or you have inflicted violence against a loved one, never be afraid to speak out as professional help is only a phone call away. As a treat to you all, this week's recommended podcast of the week is called Based on a True Crime. And if, like me, you're both a film buff and a true crime nut, Chelsea and David, who host this awesome podcast, not only do they dive into some truly classic films, such as Amityville Horror, The Exorcist, and my personal favorite, Ten Rillington Place, but they also analyse the crimes which inspired the films, debunking any myths, mistakes and narrative additions for dramatic licence. Check out the promo for Based on a True Crime. I'm Chelsea, and I love true crime. And I'm David, and I love horror movies. And we co-host Based on a True Crime, a podcast where we discuss the real cases that inspired some of the most gruesome crimes and criminals to grace the big and small screens. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play if you're interested in hearing the true stories behind some really great movies, including In Cold Blood, The Town That Dreaded Sundown, and Murder by Numbers. So grab some popcorn, with extra fake butter topping of course, and join us as we explore just how much of the movies that kept you awake at night are real. And for more photos, videos and maps of each case that we've discussed, don't forget to check out the Murder Mile website at murdermiletours.com. Or you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or even on Facebook on the Murder Mile True Crime Podcast discussion group. A quick thank you this week to the fabulous people who have left five-star reviews of Murder Mile and have been truly fabulous on social media. They include Susie Brace, Mandy Collins, Ian Flintham, Kazalicious, Ferris the Dog, I'm going to struggle to pronounce this, Nala Lamprot, I think I've mispronounced that, I apologise, Janine Madden, Claire Lett, Stuart, who left a fabulous comment on my Murder Mile blog about Denmark Place Fire. And of course, to uh, Geroid Curley, who not only listened to the Murder Mile podcast, but came all the way from Cork to come on the Murder Mile walk. And Kaz Every, who has very kindly agreed to become the moderator for the Murder Mile True Crime podcast discussion group on Facebook. So to all of you, I thank you. And of course, before we finish, a quick shout out goes out to my good friend Baz at the Extraordinary Stories podcast. If you fancy shaking up your true crime playlist and adding in a big dose of myths, murders, mysteries and conspiracies, all of which are well told and truly mind bending stuff, wrap your head around the Extraordinary Stories podcast, available on all podcast platforms. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, hello, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Next week's episode is the concluding part of Canal Killers, John Sweeney. Thank you for listening and sleep well.
Hello? Hello? Oh, hello. Welcome, friends. If you stayed this, this little bit longer, you'll know that this is Extra Mile. The extra section of Murder Mile that I deliberately do at the very end of the show. I leave a little space for those of you who want to know a little bit more about this episode. Um, as always, it's entirely unscripted. This is just me. There's no sound effects, no music, no waffle. Oh, there is waffle. It's full of waffle. There's loads of mistakes. Uh, but it's entirely improvised. Uh, and what I do is I kind of give you an insight into maybe the case or interesting things that have been happening this week. Um... So, instead of discussing the John Sweeney case, I'm going to discuss a lot of that next week because it is a two-parter. This week I wanted to introduce you to something very interesting and weird that happened to me this week. As many of you know, I run uh, the Murder Mile Walks. That's where the podcast started. I do a guided walk around Soho of various murder locations. Um, now, I, I I knew about a case years ago called the, the Murder of Ginger Way... G- uh, Ginger Ray, she was a prostitute in the 1940s, 1948, uh, and she was murdered. I knew very little about the case. It, I was planning to put it on the walk. I didn't know enough information, so I didn't in the end. I thought, well, I don't know enough, and I need to keep the, sh- the tour down under two hours. Um, but obviously, when I started the podcast, there were loads of cases that I knew about that I thought, well, now's the time to dive in. Now's the time to really dive in deep. Go to the National Archives, pull out the original police files, try and speak to people who may be newer, visit the locations, try and get a good picture of the story. Um, now, if you've obviously you've listened to the Murder Mile podcast, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, episodes eight and nine is the story of Ginger Ray. Now, any of you who've listened to that story, uh, I think it's clear to see that I, I think I approached it thinking, mm, murder of a prostitute, she's probably an alcoholic. If you listen to Dutch Lair, episode four, alcoholic, very troubled upbringing, was a prostitute from the age of 12, didn't know anything different except prostitution, had loads of debts, had lots of enemies. Uh, and that's kind of, I think I approached it in a quite an arrogant way. Or, or I won't say arrogant, I'll just say, uh, Maybe innocent, I don't know. Maybe I just didn't know enough about prostitutes to to write a story about prostitutes. So the, the, the Dutch Leia story, I was kind of, it was a sad story. But with Ginger Ray, I approached it thinking, well, she's probably an alcoholic. She probably didn't want to be a prostitute. Ginger Ray, her life blew my mind. Absolutely did. She was kind of, she was a prostitute kind of by choice, really. It was 19, She started in the 1920s when she was about 18. She was a prostitute for 23 years. She didn't really have much education. Uh, she was living in an area where women really couldn't, unless you were posh and educated, which is the same thing, essentially, in the class system of, you know, the early, early 20th century. Um, unless you were educated, you, you were just going to get factory work or... You know, you'd have to be married off or you know, become a chambermaid. Whereas she saw a way through, she was like, I'll become a prostitute. I'll do it five to six days a week. I'll only work for two or three hours. For those two or three hours, she would earn the equivalent of about 300 quid. And with that, she would socialize. She'd have loads of boyfriends. She'd have a really nice life. And she was really sweet. Um, so her story was really interesting. And it's an unsolved murder case. What I did last Saturday... Uh, was something I've never done before. Uh, I was contacted by a lovely gentleman called Ross, um, who said, "Hey, I understand you do uh, ginger ale on your walk, which I don't." But um, I was like, "Do you know? I I know enough about the case." Uh, and he was like, oh, "Well, my gran, uh, it's her seventieth birthday or, or nearby. Um, she is the niece of ginger ray and I was like, oh, wow, it's amazing. Now, this is kind of nervous moment for me, thinking, oh, shit, do you know, you're a real person, you don't want to get in trouble for this. But what they wanted was to have a guided walk of the murder location of Ginger Ray, of their great aunt. So, uh, as it, I've never done it before, I decided to do it. I met with them about two o'clock last Saturday. There's about ten of them, all different ages, all really nice. All really sweet, all interested. Um, I'll admit that I was a little bit nervous uh, at this because, you know, you're meeting victims' families for the first time. 
I've done it in terms of research, but this was kind of like, you know, in the context of people being entertained by murder. So it's a very weird thing to do. So I decided to break them in gently. Uh, what I did was for the first hour, I said, look, I'll take you on a guided tour of Soho. And I'll do some of the murder cases that I normally do on the tour. Like uh, I introduced them to a uh, British serial killer, Dennis Nielsen. There's some nice locations that I take you to and show you about the life of Dennis Nielsen. Um, William Crease um, uh, had neurosyphilis, went mad, brutally murdered his wife to death. Uh, obviously, I took them to the Dutch Lair murder location because as a murdered prostitute, I thought that fed in nicely to the story. Uh, also... So you can hear someone's yappy little shitty dog in the background. Yeah, yappy little shitty dogs. Get a proper dog. Uh, Medium sized dog, a nice collie. Um, I also uh, took them uh, to murder locations for uh, Red Max and Roger Vernon, who were the pimps in Soho around the time of, of Ginger Ray's life and death. And also I introduced them to the story of the Blackout Ripper, who will be coming to very shortly. So I introduced them to interesting Soho stories, many of which involve the murder of prostitutes. And some of the details are quite graphic. So I broke them in that way. And then we turned around the corner and I went, right, this is the part of the tour I don't normally do. But because it's you, we're going to do it for the first time today. Um. And it was really interesting. I, I kind of took my time with it. I had four or five pages of notes, um, having gone through all of the research, stuff that was in the podcast, stuff I couldn't get into the podcast as well. Research I'm still looking into. Uh, I reckon we spent about 30 minutes talking about it. It could have been longer. It, it went really well. They were really engaged. I kept checking with them, saying, is it OK to keep to go forward? Because it's like as I was stepping nearer that point where you have to describe the moment where their great aunt was murdered. This is not a woman on a podcast anymore. This is not a woman who has a name like Ginger Ray, who's, who in your mind isn't real. This is their relative. And you've got 10 people looking at you. And but they were really great. They wanted to know more. Um, They knew very little about her life. Um. I think because she was a prostitute, um, which was obviously a bit of a family scandal, uh, the brother and the sister, um, was it two of the sisters, two of the sisters and a brother weren't involved in prostitution at all. So it was a family scandal. Um, Ginger Ray was also married to a black man. This is in the 1920s. So obviously a bit of a scandal there as well. And she was murdered. Even bigger scandal. So very little of this is known about the family. So it's fascinating. I was telling them all the stuff I knew about Ginger Ray. And they were picking up stuff as well and being able to feed it back to me. So, like, I would say, you know, Ginger Ray, really sweet lady, very generous, would uh, bring in waifs and strays. And she'd be use her money to uh, give uh, the impoverished kids who were kind of post-World War II, uh, give them sweets. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what our other aunt would do. Because obviously they'd three aunties and they were like this is what our other aunt would do and I was like oh fantastic that makes sense also I, I said um, she was called Ginger Ray because because she had like red hair but was it natural red hair or did she dye it and they went no no it's entirely natural and actually two people on the tour including Ross who'd booked the tour had red hair and that was the natural colour of red hair that Ginger Ray had which was fascinating because that is exactly the shade that I imagined it was so, um, yeah, it was really lovely. Um, really good fun. Um, I gave them loads of information about who I thought the murderer was. Um, I sent them all my pictures. I'm going to keep them up to date with any other f further research that I do. And um, obviously, if we hear any more, if I learn any more about the case, and I think we might do because we'll be diving into uh, the myth of a guy called Soho Jack who apparently, apparently they say, the press say he murdered Ginger Ray, uh, Margaret Cook, who we've dealt with, but also Russian Dora and Black Rita, who we will come to very soon. Two other Soho prostitutes who will be embracing the idea of who was Soho Jack very soon. Uh, so I hope that was interesting. That was a really interesting day. Um, I think I took a picture of them using their camera and I've asked them to send me a picture, but it hasn't arrived yet. Hopefully soon. Um... 
other thing that I thought might be interesting for you on uh, <laughs> Murder Mile Extra. Um, obviously, I haven't done any uh, physical research on the John Sweeney case this week. You, last week and the week before, you've heard about me filling up trolleys full of bricks and carting uh, suitcases full of tin cans to work out how long it took someone to get from their house to the canal with a body. Um, this week, I couldn't do it because the flat where John Sweeney murdered the body and dumped it in the canal is about 3.2 miles away. So, and because he had a car, I'm guessing that he drove. It's not written anywhere, but I'm guessing it does. So there's no point in me doing an experiment because we can pretty much guess how long it took. Um, but th other things that I've thought of this week, which I thought might be interesting for you, is about my slight obsession. Um, if you've listened to a lot of Murder Miles, you've probably noticed it already. Um, two things that I'm very obsessed with and I find it difficult to write to get further in my writing unless I know these details exactly and I don't know why and here they are whenever I state a date if you notice in a newspaper it will say 1st of November 1956 yeah I can't cope with that I have to know what day it was and I don't know why I don't know why that makes a difference but 1st November 1956, if it was a Tuesday, I would go, right, okay, It's I have to write Tuesday the 1st of November 1956. And I don't know why, maybe, I think sometimes it does make a difference, especially in a city. Do you know, if it's a Monday, oh, so so for example, like with uh, the Co Thomas Co Kochik episode that we did last week with Marta Ligman, I guess that made sense because um, when I worked out that he was murdered on Friday the uh, he disposed of the body on Friday the 1st of May, which technically in Britain is a May day. But when I checked the date, Friday the 1st of May, oh, sorry, uh, 1st of May was a Friday, which is not May day, and that's not a bank holiday. So that means it was a regular day, the last day before the bank holiday. And as he was taking all of, uh, as he was taking the body down uh, Buckingham Road, Obviously, it was the last day and commuters, it would have been busy. Whereas if it was the bank holiday Monday, it would have been very quiet. Hmm. OK, that makes sense. That makes sense why I need to know the date. <laughs> OK. Another thing that I'm obsessed with slightly um, is giving you an accurate account of the weather. Very British thing. We love talking about the weather. But if, say, if you look at the Dennis Nielsen episode, um, when we're first introduced to Carl Stotter, I believe it was could be yeah Carl Stotter was the first one as he's walking down the street I tell you about how it was windy and there was a frost on the ground and it's quite cold it's all accurate it's like I can't help it what I do is I I go and find accurate accounts of the weather for that day because I find it important do you know like with this episode today when um, John Sweeney was approaching Anne's cottage in Ormskirk I got the date I got the weather for that date at the time and heard that it was it was windy as it always is in Ormskirk um my step granddad and grandma uh step granddad and step grandma used to live in Ormskirk uh I've been there a couple of times so I know it I know it relatively well and I know it's always bloody windy <laughs> it's always bloody windy because it's so bloody flat there um but also on that day it would there was a frost on the ground so uh I like adding that into the story it makes it seem real it really does Another piece of research that I did today uh, was to work out the average weight of a claw hammer in the 1980s and 90s. You may have noticed it in there that um, when John Sweeney attacked Melissa Halstead, uh, I mentioned that it was around half a kilo of steel, which is about right. Uh, the average weight was about 400, uh, 460 grams in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, so it's accurate, even though it sounds like alliteration, like I'm just adding it in. It is actually all real. It's entirely all real. I try and get it as real as I can, because sometimes it's those little details that bring you a new, fresher insight. Whew. So that was Murder Mile. No, that, that was Murder. Uh, that was the Extra Mile. I keep forgetting what it's called. Uh, so we will be back next week for the concluding part of the story of John Sweeney. And then after that, we will get into the life of the Blackout Ripper. <gasps> Hope you enjoyed the extra mile. 
and uh, uh, tune in next week. Have a good day. Bye.